Good evening and welcome to the Courtauld and to our, um, our fourth lecture in the Frank Davis uh, uh, series for, for this year. Um, our speaker this evening is Ikem Stanley Okoye, uh, who comes to us from the University of, of Delaware, where he's an associate professor in the very enviable uh, position of being um, a joint appointment between two uh, departments, between the Department of Art History and uh, the Africana Studies Department. Uh, Ikem's education was uh, divided between this country, uh, where he did his undergraduate work and, um, and his MA at the Bartlett in Architecture and Architectural Studies, uh, and the US, where he took his PhD at, at MIT. His work deals, I think, um, well, it, it best described, I think, by the word um, intersections that he uses about it, insofar as it deals both with intersections between art, architecture, and, uh, and landscapes, but also intersections in terms of geographies and in terms of uh, time. So that he's a particular expert in the art of, of West Africa, but also looks at other regions of Africa, Central Africa, um, as well as um, across the Atlantic uh, to the Caribbean, <coughs> to the American South, to, uh, to Brazil, and also back to uh, imperial, uh, imperial Europe. He also deals with intersections in a broader sense in terms of uh, temporalities, in that his work uh, spans from the uh, pre-colonial uh, 18th century and the transatlantic slave trade of that period right up until the, um, the present day. He has received uh, numerous uh, and important grants and fellowships, uh, including one from the Canadian Centre for, for Architecture, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Institute for, of Advanced Studies at Princeton, and the Modern Oriental Institute in uh, Berlin, amongst, amongst, uh, amongst others. He's also uh, published widely. Uh, I remember particularly an important uh, conversation in the Art Bulletin uh, around the theme of aesthetics, ethnicity, and the history of art, uh, but also uh, in a whole a variety of different journals that you can see uh, listed under his biography on the, um, on the, on the website. He's also contributed to numerous volumes, again, uh, a volume uh, edited by Marriott Westerman on the uh, anthropologies of art comes, uh, comes most readily to, to mind. He has two uh, projects uh, running at the, at the, the, the moment, one on uh, art and, and slavery, which will uh, come out in the, in the future, but another book which is uh, going to come out next year, or this year perhaps even, next, next, next year, year. Uh, with the wonderful title uh, hideous architecture, which uh, I can't, we can't wait uh, to read. Uh, this evening, he's going to talk to us about emergent evacuations, African women's corporate bodies, and art historical insight. Ike. Um, thank you very much, um, Scott, for that um, introduction. I um, should also say thank you for the invitation and also thank you to, uh, to uh, both uh, Suzanne, who I just met, and also Leila Bumba, who I'm not sure is here, but who I've obviously been dealing with in terms of the logistics of getting myself here. Uh, so it's been uh, a great pleasure. I have spent uh, a few days in London. The weather has been fairly cooperative, <laughs> and uh, one couldn't actually ask for better. I think my only regret is that I have to leave tomorrow. I wish I had more time to be here. But this is literally in the middle of our, well, second half of our semester. So I get back and then I have a lecture literally the very next day after a faculty meeting in the evening. Um, so there we, there we go. Um, when, I, when I got the invitation to to give this presentation, I had a set of ideas for what I was going to speak about. And I only sort of came to realize slowly that it's become a paper that's taking current research and, in a way, looking back at some things I've worked on before. Much more that, much more about what it's like to look back and what things one gets wrong when you look back with a telescope from the pre present in the past. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, something new emerges. One does one's best at the time, but something new emerges. And I was really quite surprised with where I finally uh, 
ended up thanks to current research, which isn't and which wasn't actually focused on the material that I'm about to present. So I hope you find this quite interesting. And in the interest of time, because I know we only have an hour, I will go right into the paper. So my talk is about three moments in time and the explorations of the body in those three moments. Body discourse is, of course, now an established subfield within the humanities. But I am more interested in intersections between the idea of bodies and the con connected one of the degree or not to which we desire mastery over them, and the questions thus raised about bodily sovereignty and freedom. It's almost about the question, can we ever be free? Although we shall see it's not quite that. My ultimate focus will be on a 19th century work of African sculpture, uh, which is Oops, well, title and all that, which is this one on your left, and separately on a woman born in the 19th century and whose life unfolds in the first two decades of the 20th century colonial archive. At least we think this is the woman, or I think this is her. Although not entirely at the center of this presentation, though, I want to start by saying that for a few years now, I have occasionally, though not consistently, grappled with a particular period of the work of Nigerian-born British artist Sokari Douglas Camp. More than the others, and more than the others of, of, and her younger contemporaries, she stuck mainly to traditional media, straight out sculpture, work that is often whimsical even when engaging politically charged <coughs> topics. Her work appears literal and easily consumed. I'm not sure that today she would be thought among the most critically interesting artists of the black British contemporary. The way we might say, think, you know, Roshini Kempadu or a few other black artists of the African and or Afro-Caribbean diaspora. Like Kempadu's work, Camp's references places outside the United Kingdom, especially in relation to global mobilities, and not untypically in relation to histories of racial slavery and bonded labor. For Douglas Camp, is there or was there once a conceptual complexity and depth to her early work that has been missed over the years and that saves her from the inane evaluations of, say, a scholar like Donald Cuspit, who sort of wrote a recent review of um, Sokari's work that, that I think is actually quite um, hollow in a way, and suggests that he too fails to grasp a certain complexity to this artist's work. Especially for, for foreign black youngsters growing up in the UK, one is and was forced to encounter the particularity of their own embodiment, evident in the reading of their bodies and its gestures as foreign. And maybe I should say that I grew up in the UK, so this is slightly biographical at this point. Given the artist's biography, I saw that Douglas Camp's work might be read as a subtle expression of her own experiences of things similar. It is not simply an issue of race either. For any non-European person living, non-European person arriving to live in England, as did Douglas Camp at a young age, the difference between her gestures and forms of locomotion and that of the English people, and others of the United Kingdom, by whom she was surrounded, would have been striking. She would have struggled, as I confess to have done too, First, to assert the legitimacy of her own body's language in the new context. And secondly, and much later, the mastery of European forms of body. In any such transition, the subject ultimately struggles with her or his own progressively alienated body, forcing its acquisition of new forms. Alfonso Lingis wrote rather lucidly on related matters, asserting, for example, that, quote, in perceiving the outer form of the others, we capture in our postural schema the corresponding inner lines of their postures and movements, unquote. 
the body does not, at least initially, necessarily lose its originary vocabulary, but rather becomes adept at transiting between the two expressive bodies in order to keep control of one's interactions in, one, in any particular place, and in order to remain attuned to gesture and bodily comportments, the manipulation of which is critical to a fluent functioning within, within both cultures. So whether one is here, or in her case, traveling occasionally to Nigeria. Of course, for a girl becoming a woman, and one who was subsequently expectant, additionally specific perspectives were introduced, although I cannot explore this aspect today. So, you know, she got married um, and has uh, one, or, one or two children, and at some point was also pregnant while she was doing and making art. In explaining her early work, which involved a close study especially of Calabari and Ijo cultures, of places like Buguma, Boni, and Nembe. She positioned her work publicly in relation to customary cultural practices significantly linked to the pre-1890s era, since subsumed by the term traditional. She connected aspects of her work, the absence of bodies in her sculpted figures, for instance, to these cultures by insisting that this connection stems from her retaining Calabari sculpture's dread of realist mimesis of the body. At the time, she also suggested that in the social division of artistic labor, women did not sculpt, let alone do so for figural representation. And so she was not sculpting the bodies of her subjects. And maybe I should have that image up now. And so she was not sculpted in the bodies of her subjects. It was a kind of gesture of respect for the ancestral universes by which she was inspired. Her work was therefore a clear articulation of ghostly bodies, sculptural ciphers for the sculptural body proper that remained invisible, but always only signal and or implied. The sculptural body itself was absent, in other words, a kind of corporeal evacuation the artist achieves through the tracing of their exterior in acts of somatic surfacing. Bodies were present largely because of what the figures wore. Moreover, her work did not hide this fact. One could see that their interiors were emptied, and yet these were also clearly weighty objects whose volume and physical presence were palpable standing next to any one of them. Douglas Camp's absent bodies seem, therefore, to refuse identification with the supposedly inevitable but imaginary occupation of her objects based on southern Nigerian culture's penchant, especially the Calabari Ijo iterations to which she can lay claim. Whoops. When traces of the body occur, as they do, for example, in Inia's chair or Nigerian woman shopping on your left, the very necessity to connect the invisible body to the visible handbag that Nigerian woman shopping carries falter in the manner in which it is delineated. This is not merely an issue of the material in which the artist works and for which one would be correct in suggesting a relative absence of a certain malleability. I think instead that her figures strike poses that are quite literally marionette-like, awkward, communicating a kind of failure, which may be entirely int intentional on the artist's part to figure the body adequately. Consistently, either in the direct manner of an invisible, evacuated corporeal space, or in the stiffened immobility of the figures themselves, she explored the different vocabularies of the black body when juxtaposed with the European one. And incidentally, this is a difference also recognized as much in European travel narratives in the pre-colonial period as in some historical African art itself. One can argue that both the emptying out and the gestural awkwardness of her fully embodied work are connected to the question of mastery calls up questions 
whether this particular artist had the skill to figure her bodies in ways that are persuasive. And I have to say that I made a certain assumption, which I may or may not be correct about, that an audience in London would be very, very familiar with Sokari's work, because since I did this early work, she's really blossomed and has become one of the most successful artists, and her work has uh, proliferated across the landscape of public art as well. Um, so where was I? Since I presume that she, in fact, does, does, that she does, she can produce much more persuasive figural postures in her work, which is to say that she could produce more natural poises, then it must be that she resisted the impulse to render a certain sovereignty to artistic subjectivity and the regular practices on which it is usually erected. And here I'm thinking about institutions, modeling, the kinds of uh, uh, um, training that an artist would normally go through in order to develop the skills of, of those kinds of representative um, um, possibilities. Historical African art was often focused on mastery too, of course, within its own materials and mediums and the aesthetics these were capable of supporting. Some artistic categories went well beyond this, however, and produced instruments signifying mastery, as well as they also became integral to religious representational practices meant to reproduce such mastery for its commissioners, who were always men. A practice found in some form among the Calabari Ijo, who are Sokari Douglas Camps' um, ancestral um, people. Its most obvious sculptural forms are found among nearby riverine peoples of the Delta and Near Delta, with whom the Ijo share the riverine ecologies. In an object type known variously as Ikenga or Ikega, a word or phrase often translated as altar to the hand or altars of the hand. Sculpted objects that were and are dedicated to such personal mastery, supporting an ideology close to the Western notion of the self-made man. These were altars that typically represented hoped for properties of the commissioner, as a warrior carrying a carved head indicating victory over adversaries or competitors, and sometimes a figure carries a miniature version of itself as altar that too carries a miniaturized head. And um, I don't have that example here, but the image on your left, uh, sometimes there's a miniature version of that also carrying a head in this exact position. Centered on success, they correlated with the wish for dominance and associate this with destroying the other. Most men acquired these forms of self-representation as new heads of household, no pun there, asserting a sense of their own personal bodily sovereignty that a mid 20th century scholar once described as a quote, king in every man. It is clear, however, that this king's concern is not just with himself, but with the rule, that is to say, sovereignty over his family as a private estate. African art, in this instance, Ijo, Igbo, and Igala nationalities, made their historical commentary on mastery, and therefore inevitably on the question of freedom. Other sculpted object types, such as the one before us, which was produced in the city-state of Asaba, well, it was about to be before you, exists from the same cultural milieu, bearing on these issues in even more elaborate ways. Few surviving African sculptures, however, engage, capture, the representation of the status of a captive and the social meaning of captivity with this one sophistication. Produced before 1888, we don't actually know when it was made, but this is the date in which it enters a British collection, actually 1890 more accurately. 1888 is the day in which it enters British hands, shall we say. It was taken from a shrine in or around the few days of the colonial conflagration at Asaba 
although it was probably not the shrine's most important work. It depicts a multiplicity of figures, some deceptively literal in their identities, postures, and states, as if the whole assembly was meant to be partially narrative. Organized in a double register, it assembles figures that have been painted over in a design of dark spots arranged in roughly parallel lines over white pigment. The registers themselves are separated by a band painted in a ring of alternating triangles. The lower register arranges a group of four figures, each located at the four corners of an implied square or rectangle. The figures lower register, the figures at this lower register, though certainly communicating specific ideas individually and in relation to one another, are far less distinct as characters next to those of the upper register, which by contrast poses a large European style top hat wearing, elephant tusk bearing central figure in the company of five others, mainly half this figure's height. One makes reasonable assumption that the privilege of sovereignty was a male prerogative, not the least in consideration of altars of the hand that we just saw and similar objects from Edo, Benin, all the way to Iboku and Unri. So these are pre-colonial traditions from the 16th, 15th, all the way back to the 19th century. We can make the same assumption also because the central figure here is larger than all the others and wears the hat. It was moreover described by the object's captors as the city's national god, leading one to believe with good reason, reason that it represented a male character of importance, whether it's one time chief or historical founder. Because in addition, its central tableau presents what seems to be a marriage scene, if it's not about something far more racy, even. <laughs> the object's easily recognized high status female figure in the middle of all the others, and well, two thirds the size of the chief she faces directly, wears a complex, but in its class, ever-changing, fashionable coiffure typical of younger women, especially at formal events. So I'm talking about you know, her hair here, but you can also just see through here, and you can sort of see the back of it here. That she is of superior status, however, is indicated by the chiefly fan and short staff of office she wields in both her hands as she faces the large chiefly figure. So here she is holding a fan, and here's the staff of her, of some kind of staff of office she holds in her other hand. The tall chiefly figure poses as a subject of commanding support. Its elbows rest on the heads of two attendants, one obviously a praise singing flautist, so this guy is playing music. The other is a young woman with distended stomach who covers her eyes in sorrow or shame from something she has just seen, question mark. The chief also poses other emblems of power still displayed today by such persons, elephant tusk, iron rattle, as is more rarely the elaborately painted face, indicating for the artist who made the subject, I think, chiefly face scarring. In other words, these were marks of the scarred face intentionally of the chief. The object can be read as a statement about status, including that of the depicted chiefly couple whose social position is signaled by their juxtaposition to the controlled bodies of others, as implied on the two upper figures on whose heads elbows rest, but also shown in the literally bound and captive figure beside the shamed woman. So, sort of obvious, he and he here. The caryatid lower figures who carry the main tableau, and I don't know caryatid might be an improper term to describe <laughs> the tradition, but in the interest of time I use such words here, um, 
the, uh, the uh, um, figure who carries the main tab who carried the main tableau symbolized control of labor by obviously the person up top. Although apart from the three figures at this upper register, all the others are in subservient roles, they are not performing deference, subservience, or submission equally. Some are musician, one appears to be carrying his drum. Others are gestural figures expressing some emotion the viewer is meant to read. One or two are minion-like, passively accepting their role as human stuff on which an elbow may rest. And then there's the gagged captive. In my initial, initial brief uh, publication of it in about 1998, um, I stated this straightforwardly, especially as I was juxtaposing the object formally with other arg others arguably of its kind, double register sculptures with narrative tableau, which I actually have here, and we can um, look it up later if need be. A subsequent and more focused article destined for the anthology uh, in 2008, titled uh, Literary Manifestations of the Transatlantic Slave Trade, emphasized this work's being about chiefly status and on the ways in which captivity and the subservience of others, which is to say mastery over them, seemed integral to the object's chieftaincy, chieftaincy, its performance of chiefliness. The artist who produced this work has left us with clues for insight into the society's identification of notions akin to agency, freedom, and sovereignty which some scholars suggest was ongoing as oral literary argument in an Asaba, the, the city in which this object comes from, debating entry or not into the slavery economy. Take the fact that the relationship among all its figures connects status with dominance, uh, but also with a kind of graded control of the bodies of others. There is no guilt here, no sign of a moral issue at stake. It is simply a description of the world as given and therefore participates in, in the conversation, especially because seeming even more than Ikenga to anticipate the terrible outcomes for any society of a certain uncompromising insistence on individual sovereignty. Of course, from a hardly comparable context, this is exactly what Hannah Arendt meant when she argued for an understanding of freedom in which it, personal sovereignty, sovereignty, was not necessarily pitted against the former freedom. Personal body sovereignty, that is to say the human person's ability and right to be or see themselves as being a masterful agent of his or her own destiny, destiny inevitably rests, her critique went, not only on a rejection of plurality, but is complicit with both domination and what she called destruction. The Ikenga and other altars of the hand, which were also familiar in Asaba and its region, presumably therefore also likely fostered such a rejection, which may be essentially why the enslaved person coming from a different world just north appears not to be visible as human and therefore subjectable to implied acts of unempathetic dispatch. They might be sacrificed to someone else's gods. The Asaba object seems to be unequivocal in its sanction both of homogeneousness and of the destructions of beings not considered as belonging. Indeed, something about the captive's body is more animal-like than others. The roundedness of the shoulders above the bounded elbows seeming much more bird-like than human, despite its oversized penises uncompromising, if not just full, is that a word, indication of the victim's maleness. Yet, we seem to be missing something of its meaning. Its colonial misnaming strongly suggests this, 
simply because this culture never represents the idea of, the, of a singular supreme deity, as if it had some kind of a dread of representing the sublime in the finiteness of a material culture's mediums. Moreover, it appears to be an assembly in the sense that the objects from a different and very likely older work, including both the bride who sat at an angle and the slightly taller female figure with hair like an afro and cusped hands. I don't know if you remember her. I'm sort of scared to move to the next image. No, nope. let's go back. Where was she? That's the person I'm talking about, who was, I don't know, somewhere. Well. Are clearly, they are, so these two figures, are clearly nailed onto the main work rather than sculpted from the same wood blocks as are all its other characters. Moreover, these nailed on appendages reveal clues to being older works by perhaps two or three previous farming season cycles. The assembly we have bequeathed is a work that consists of at least two figures plundered from earlier work and possibly at the hands of the artist producing them all in order to produce the scene of a marriage not necessarily intended in the original work figuring the chief. A new understanding of the issues and new ways to read them as provided by a reassembly is delivered from an unexpected source whose protagonists are not anonymous as are the ones in this work. This source also gives more access to African voices, both of chiefs and their clients, in terms ag arguably relate related to the questions of mastery, freedom, and plurality. This photograph, a cropped version of which I showed at the beginning of the talk, was taken circa 1913 and likely pictures this central source, whose name is Adelina Wari, or at least it pictures a group of her peers. Yet what we do know about Adelina suggests that the fearless, self-confident woman pictured to the right and the place she appears to occupy among the women folks she's posed with evokes Adelina's stature or the kind she would have had in her many communities. Neither the fact that she and the woman in the photograph, if worry she is not, are both of the matrilineal Idzon people of Nembe, also in the Delta, nor the fact that from Nembe she occasionally traveled to Lagos in a liaison with a foreign man, Mr. P.H. Plonge, likely a Caribbean or Ghanaian expatriate, has brought Adelina Wari the attention of scholars. Wari and Plonge never marry. We have no picture of Plonge. She has a son in boarding school in Lagos, in boarding school, mind you, the other reason for her travels. Mr. Plonge is not this boy's father. So a woman you would think would have garnered some attention. Before the 1920s of her penultimate and sudden disappearance from the colonial archive, itself likely a sign of a final colonial government act of erasure, we encounter Miss Wari almost two decades earlier, sometime in 1904, when she brought a matter of circa 1896 directly to the colonial government concerning her inheritance in a house, small age, that is real property, as well as a corporate body also known as house, capital H, which is to say a building, it's incorporated members, not necessarily blood relatives, some enslaved, and all of its corporeal affiliates, many of who live within the building, a trading entity of sorts as well. She claimed to be the rightful heir, not merely to both house and house, but to other properties that included fishing grounds, wetlands, and land that, as far as she knew, was leased to and occupied by the first settlement of the church 
Missionary Society in Nembe. All had likely been bequeathed to Adelina by her merchant younger brother, Chris, Christopher Worry, six years earlier in 1896 or 1897. Her inheritance had apparently been reconfirmed around her brother's deathbed with a few trusted house confidence, confidence present. From Adelina's initial 1904 appeal to the circa 1923 escalation to the Supreme Court in Lagos, she and her lover, Mr. Plange, who was literate, where Adelina's literacy is uncertain, launched many other appeals and petitions to lower courts, as well as furious outreaches and campaigns to organizations and institutions, both local and overseas, including ones to colonial metropolitan London. Most insistent of her appeals abroad were the ones to the anti-slavery society and to the Aboriginal Protection Society. Even with looking at scans, at the possibility she sought to retain formerly enslaved persons as property, Adelina struggled to wrest back her property with an intransigent spirit that is nothing but admirable. Ultimately, she was permanently banished from Nembe, her hometown, by fiat of the administrator. She was also more than once publicly, quote, dragged on the ground, and these are her own words, and she was, as she resisted arrest, and on many occasions, then imprisoned, tortured, starved, and serially exiled across four towns. Each fresh expulsion meant fresh dispossessions of newly acquired property, because rather irrepressible Adelina Wari in exile went about after each imprisonment, one lasted for nine months, starting up new businesses and that these new locations acquired or erected new business premises. I cannot go into much detail here regarding the case, but key contextual information indicates that she was a chief in waiting and expected to head the house, capital H, to which she belonged, had it not been for the colonial interruption. Moreover, her primary usurper, Alfred Worry, was a child, incorp was, once was, I meant, a child incorporated into the house with his young enslaved mother. It also emerges that Adelina was ranged against powerful men of Nembe allied to Alfred and who had seized other worry property for themselves by exploiting the colonial state's patriarchal foundations, tendencies, Victorian mores, and preferences regarding the place of women. For Adelina Worry, being prevented from the rightful headship of the larger corporate body to which she belonged by restraining her personal control of everyday life and its freedoms in personal spatial mobility was shattering. Where Adelina once was admitted to, the, to authority as a matter of reason, she instead was progressively confronted by a new equation of power fit only for disbelief. Her inherited corporate body was forcefully dissolved and its former constituents dispersed into guardianships that she alleges were knowingly complicit with slavery's economies. We know that many of these former house members ran away from the new arrangements of guardianship and care not the least a few run by Christian missions, and that those escaped from its strictures and disciplines sought Adelina out at the forested margins of the many towns to which she was serially banished. These outcomes raise intriguing questions that may seem not relevant to art historical inquiry. inquiry. Why were some runaways not embracing the liberated statuses now supposedly granted by, granted by freedom? but instead seeking Adelina out. With the caveat that corporate house slavery here was hardly what we imagine when we speak the word slavery in the West regarding plantation slavery in the Americas, the property bequeathed Adelina would have included a number, perhaps 30 or so, persons of various ages there as enslaved. 
And I have to sort of add to that that sort of there were there were probably thirty people who were there as enslaved in a corporate house that would have had about one hundred and twenty or so members. Adelina's shifting subject positions in relation to her swirling universe and its attempts to remove her from the scene of power are difficult to wrap one's mind around. And I had a big struggle trying to sort of construct as short a narrative as I could of her. But in the end, I decided to just do it with this uh, image because it would take too long to tell the story. But she was a princess in waiting, and then she became a prisoner, then she got released, and she became a local bar matron in exile, and then an anonymous seasonal urban migrant to Lagos, and then quite invisible as a street vendor or a poor woman shacked up in the servants' quarters behind a house whose address I have, and I know she couldn't have lived in the main house. And then finally, a cohabiting woman with Mr. Plunge, not married, which if you sort of think back to the world in which she comes from, she was being quite a forward, progressive, independent woman at the edges of something we might even think of as a sort of femin feminist, um, um, of, of, um, feminist, feminist person. And then ultimately she becomes a sort of international rights petitioner. She's hounded by the colonial state um, who have forced her, uh, hounded by the colonial state, uh, forced and volunteered spatial relocations or displaced. Dis these would have challenged anyone. Sorry, my text is a little bit jumbled here. These transitions would have challenged anyone even today. But I'm also interested rather in what were its interior effects, how and to what extent did person like she, women especially, effect such evacuations of their former selves? I wish I had a map to sort of show you where she was moving, how far these places are from each other culturally. I also have reports of how she's describing her experiences in these places in her petitions to the colonial, uh, to the colonial administrations. And we get a very clear sense of how she's completely changing who she is simply in order to continue to be. These questions are vested in the idea of freedom and of sovereignty that we have encountered in objects contemporary and coextensive with Adelina's story. I am calling Adelina's moves evacuations, evoking the idea raised for me by Sokari Douglas Camp's work in the face of a patriarchal society proscribing certain pursuits because at every turn, they imply emptying out by Adelina, tactical, rapid, dramatic, nostalgia-free, and absolutely subjectivity transforming in the light of colonial suppression. If Adelina experienced and understood well the fact of displacement's production, both of estrangement and alienation, then we are hardly surprised to know that she found imprisonment unbearable. What then about her empathy given these experiences to her once non-sovereign wards? What in other words about Adelina's views of others' experiences of Nembe's forms of slavery? Given that houses incorporated non-sovereign bodies, how did Adelina worry think of her own freedom in relation to the recently acquired ones of the houses once unfree, supposedly with what at the time became a growing reputation as the urban drunk. And so she, there are lots of descriptions in what she writes and in what colonial authors also uh, leave in the archives about what had happened to these formerly uh, enslaved people of hers. Or on the other hand, what did House members, at least some of whom were enslaved, think universal freedom meant? What would their own thinking in the circumstance inform us about how sovereign a body, its space, the body itself is capable ever of achieving, and under what conditions? Was the idea of freedom ever an immediate possibility, that is to say, imaginable in this place? Thinking about both the attempt to erase Adelina from connections as a person of power within the colonial world, using a possibly hypocritical slavery allegation, and her tactics for overcoming this, that is to say, the strategy of evacuation she deploys, 
refocused my attention on the object from Asaba, and especially the possibility that both colonial operatives and we scholars that have come after may have evacuated its meaning too, but in this instance, not for the edifying purpose of anything salvific. I want to close by arguing that a Delina story demanded a return to the Asabar object, and in a sense, by deploying the scholar Ronke Oyewumi's view about gender in African society, where art and art history is concerned, wonder whether we were justified in assuming the hatted figure's uncomplicated gender. The result of this questioning has been quite astounding for me, an example of something hidden in plain sight. The larger figure wearing a man's hat can be seen as the point in which the artist signals the central figures not being exactly female and not being exactly male either, once we remind ourselves that, as is the case for Adelina's Nembe, women chiefs in their ranks also existed at Asaba. I want to argue that there are three ways to see the figure as gender fluid. She may represent a biological female to whom has been attached male physical attributes as we, as we are familiar with, say, in the bearded women of Yoruba Oboni, except that in this instance, the sculptor chief who once wore a cloth around her waist that appears to now be lost, sports a small penis, certainly not comparable, though, to the outsized one of the naked captive. Or he may be a cross-dressing man, or lastly, she may, if this represents an actual historical person, have been female who did actually possess male genitalia. The problem with reading the image simplistically as a male chief is that what the figure wears does not add up. The beads around the figure's waist. I don't know, I should probably have uh, an image of her just so well. This will do on your left. The beads around the um, figure's waist are intensely gendered in this culture, I discover, for only women ever wore them, large, broad corals. It is a marker of femininity and even of youthful femininity at that. More extremely, the broad ivory anklets, the slightly smaller ivory bracelets, and the variety of thick ivory necklace with its large, doubled rectangular piece just above the wearer's shoulders, <coughs> worn tightly around the neck, signal belonging to the highest rank of a, chief, a chiefly woman could achieve. In the colonial photographic and post-colonial archive, so I'm talking about this round her neck too, but in the uh, colonial and post-colonial archive, no single instance, not one, in which a man wears such a necklace has ever been found. If it's anything to go by, even the modern artist Ben and Wormwood's painting titled Asaba of about 1963 shows an all-male group of chiefs at Asaba, feet definitely devoid of anklets. Here's some detail. Moreover, those elements of dress that we had taken for men's attire are not quite that here. Not only did women chiefs wear such hats in the Delta and near Delta, as was seen in the photograph of Adelina and her group. So you can sort of see, I think it's a good example of this woman here. But at Asaba, the colonial archive indicates, without comment on its political implications, that chiefly women too had their faces cicatrized as only chiefs could. So, these markings on the face, women, chiefs could also do that. And I'm sort of struck by the painting around the eyes of this woman chief and the fact that we also have that around the eyes of the figure. The geometric pattern on the face of the objects were therefore no basis to assign gender. And when I've sort of circulated this amongst other people who work in this region, they're actually quite shocked that women could actually have their faces cicatrized in this manner. This object therefore depicts a chiefly woman whose status is like we're men, signaled by similar tropes such as the gag man and bad man, ba bound man, praise singers and karyatid figurines. 
In that context, the outsized penis re-emphasizing the captive's maleness has a logic if we understand that he has to meet his possible end in relation to establishing incontrovertible power of the female chief. She cannot have power over only a lesser man if this object ever got placed next to other such objects dedicated to male chiefs. If we take her male genitalia literally, not symbolically, symbolically then the sight, the sight viewing of it could be why the young woman gestures shame. But what then of the marriage scene? Although Ifi Amadume had several decades ago or explored the subject in her book, Male Daughters, Female Husbands, we had never seen it depicted in art before. I am suggesting that this is exactly what, what this object does, depicts a woman marrying another woman. Interestingly, this was and remains a practice amongst highest rank, chiefly women of Asaba today, although whether or not this is a relationship involving sex is not certain. I just leave you to look at these. Chiefly women in Asaba, of course, also suggest that in relation to empathy for the unfree and to the issue of sovereignty, the subject of the sculpture, and perhaps Adelina too, before her displacements, would not have operated in any way different from her male peers. However, unlike Ikenga, the sculpture from Asaba seems to recognize a different possibility for relationships between agencies. And indeed, the literary scholar Obi Nemeka has explored the live and let live ethos in this region. In Asaba, women stand ages in men, just like the local adage that goes something like this. When one thing stand, stands, another thing stands next to it without any desire for the one to annihilate the other in order to be. Certainly not addressed to the existence of the small number of the unfree in such societies on whose shoulders rest the freedom of those at its top, it seems entirely likely on the basis of worries remunerations that it would not have required colonialism to bring such societies to a place in which questions about the enslaved too would be asked. This was precisely the direction in which social ethics was moving as the example of slaves who years later and before colonialism proper were heads of the corporate houses with authority over the born frees of the corporate bodies they had entered as enslaved. And think about how impossible that would be in the history of slavery in the Americas. It seems to be at play as well that is, the idea of one thing standing and another thing just standing, in ways we do not have access to in the relationship that Adelina's former slaves prefer her leadership and her guardianship, even as a dispossessed, powerless woman in exile, to that of the region's most well-known female missionary, Mary Slessor. That's it. <laughs>